So this video is going to be about what's known as Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. And what it deals with, it looks at if it's po always possible to have fair elections with three or more candidates. Which, you know, we always hear about this notion of, you know, the election's not fair, or the election is fair, or no, it was rigged. Um, and I always thought this was a super neat topic because it's this really cool overlap of political science, which I find fascinating. I thought about being a political science major. Mathematics, which you probably clearly know that I do like, and, and voting theory. And, you know, we see this stuff all the time. You know, anytime somebody else gets elected, there's all this gerrymandering and cutting up of the map. And this is a huge deal, uh, you know, this voting power and how you carve up the electorate. But, okay, so, but let's just focus on, is it possible to have a fair election with three or more candidates? So, you know, if somebody approached me with this question, the first thing I would think is, you know, well, why are we starting with three candidates? Look at, let's, let's look at two. And also, what, it, what does that mean to be fair? Because, you know, if we don't have a, a criteria of fairness, well then, you know, how do we rigorously determine if something's fair or not? We're just waving our hands otherwise. So let's, let's look at those issues first. So let's start with two candidates. So if you have two candidates, the easiest way to always have a fair election, though, and it's the one thing we would do most likely, right? You know, you just use majority rule. Whoever gets more than 50% of the votes, that person is the winner. I can hear some of you saying, what if they tie? Well, it's actually happened that people tie. So you can do one of two things. You can, I guess, redo the election. I remember one case, it was a while ago. It was a, you know, it was a decent sized town for sure. It wasn't like there, were, there was a population of two, but these two people, I think they were running for mayor and they tied and they ended up flipping a coin. So who knows? But uh, you know, the odds of that happening are, are pretty low. So majority rule. It actually turns out in the USA, um, we don't just do majority rule. We, we do, but we do a variation. It's not based on the popular vote. It's based on, you know, it, it, for here, we've got Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. They were running to be the Democratic no presidential nominee, um, and they used delegates. And for our president, we used the Electoral College. And you can obviously get into a whole other argument there. Should we even be using the Electoral College, or should it be a popular vote? You know. Um, Al Gore lost the, the election, the presidential election, despite winning the uh, popular vote, but he lost the electoral college vote. So that's a, a, a deep topic for another video, but I think one worth discussing. So at this point in time, it turned out that Hillary Clinton ended up with a, a little over 2,800 of the delegates. Bernie had almost 1,900. Well, Hillary got the majority. She became, she is now the Democratic nominee. So what makes an election fair? So let's talk about these criteria quickly. And OK, so again, these are subjective, right? But people have been studying this problem for, for hundreds of years, for a long time, more than that. And mathematicians and political scientists now have these four criteria that they have agreed upon that makes a voting system fair. So again, you know, you can always take an exception with any of these. But to me, looking at them, I think they all seem reasonable. So. So the first criteria, if a candidate does get the majority, okay, so they get over 50% of the votes, that candidate should be the winner. I think we all, I feel comfortable with that at least. So suppose you have, you know, four candidates, and if you start doing pairwise races, you've got A, B, C, and D. Suppose you just took A and B. If person A won, okay, great. Then if we just took A and C, you know, suppose that person A beat person C, if just those two were winning. And likewise, if you had two candidates A and D, suppose person A would win over person D. So they win all the pairwise races. Well, if that happens, we say, we, we say well, it would be fair for person A, candidate A, to have won the election. Uh, third criteria here. And suppose that some candidates declared the winner and then a second election's held. Suppose people are actually ranking the candidates and in the second election they decide to rank you know, the person who originally won even higher, well then that person should still win. And the last criteria here is, it says, suppose that some candidate wins and then for some reason a, a second election is held. Suppose one of the original people that had lost drops out, nobody changes their preferences, well then it says the person who originally won should again win. So again, I have no objections to, to any of those criteria. They all seem reasonable to me. Okay, so let's look at having three or more people, three people in this case. So suppose Hillary got 2% of the votes, Donald, the Donald got 1%, and I got 97%. Well, I got the majority, so I should win. No problem in this case. 
But what happens if nobody gets a majority? So what if Hillary gets 32%, Donald gets 35%, Patrick gets 33%? Who should be the winner? That's the question. And that's something worth thinking about for a second. Well, you know, I think that the, we'll look at a few different situations here. So the first one we're going to look at is what's known as plurality. We'll look at a runoff. If you have more candidates, you will end up doing what's called a sequential runoff. We'll look at a point system and also a pairwise comparison. So we're not going to go through all these, but these are some, some, some common voting schemes. So let's start with a plurality because that is the easiest one. So a plurality just simply says whoever has the most votes, right, whoever has the most votes, not the majority, because again, majority implies over 50%. So whoever has the most votes, in this case, the plurality, that person's going to be the winner. So in this case, the Donald got 35%. That's the plurality. So you know what that means? That means it's time to move to Canada. So no, no, no. Oh, no, I'm just joking. We're just having a little fun here. All you Trump supporters, I'm sure Emperor, uh, Emperor Trump of the universe will do a great job. So... Um, Honestly, I'm not excited about either of them, but I, I'm trying to keep my political views out here, so I'll, I'm going to shut up right there. So, okay, um, so, but let's look at a different situation. Um, I tried to leave my politics out. I didn't do a good job, did I? So, um, but let's look at a different situation. So, okay, so, so Donald got the plurality. He could be declared, reasonably be declared the winner. And this is a common thing that happens because it saves money, because otherwise you have to go redo things, revote people. It takes more time. Um, so a lot of times we do pick a plurality, but suppose that there was a runoff. So since me and the Donald had the most votes, we get to go head to head here. Well, suppose that all of Clinton's supporters preferred me over Donald Trump. Well, if we had a runoff in that case, it turns out that now I'm going to get 65% of the votes. So reasonably, I, I have a reasonable claim to say that I am the winner of the election. So who's got more of a claim to winning? I don't know. Um, but in this situation, I would now be the winner. And this has actually been an argument to try to keep third party candidates out of elections for better or for worse. So, you know, some people were wondering if Bernie Sanders was actually going to run as an independent, you know, as a third party candidate. And now he's decided not to. He said he's not going to do it. But there was some pressure, some big pressure on him not to do it because they thought he might take away enough of Hillary Clinton's votes to help. Donald Trump become the president. And this was actually a big deal back in 1992, uh, the 1992 presidential election. I remember this. I was a, a young guy at that time. So the established Democratic candidate was Bill Clinton. The Republican candidate had George Bush Sr. And then here comes uh, the, the big uh, businessman, Ross Perot, and he gained a lot of traction, more than any third party candidate has for quite a while. But it's been argued, for better or worse, that you know, that Ross Perot took enough of George Bush's supporters to where it ended up that Bill Clinton actually became the president. So whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. You need a crystal ball to know for sure. But uh, that was one of the charges leveled at Ross Perot was that he contributed to Bush losing the election. So let's look at a point system here real quick. And this is actually the way that they pick... Uh, they rank football teams in, in the U.S., American football teams, for, for those of you that are not in the U.S. And I forget, you know, I, I don't know how, they've got so many people that vote, I don't know how you get to be a voter, but they use a point system. Okay, so what we have here is a preference schedule. Um, and, you know, so, so the first column, if you want to look at the first column, it says Trump, Clinton, PJMT. It says there's nine people that ranked Trump as their first Pick, Clinton as their second, and me as their third. Likewise, there's six people that had Clinton as their first choice, me as their second, Trump as their third. Last but not least in the last column there, you've got five people that picked me as their first choice, uh, Clinton as second, Trump as third. Okay, so there's, there's other preference schedules that you could have here. I've just picked three of them. So with three candidates, the first place a first place vote is worth three points, a second place vote is worth two points, and a last place vote is worth one point. So how many points did everybody get? Well, let's do Trump first. So he got nine first place votes, so he gets uh, nine votes worth three each. 
If you look in the second column, he got six votes worth one point each because he came in third place. And if you look at the last column, he got another five votes worth one point each because again, he's in third place. So that gives Trump 38 points. Clinton, if you do the same math, she has 46 points and I've got 36 points. Uh, excuse me, Clinton has 46 points uh, and I have 36 points. So, but again, by a plurality, notice that Donald Trump would win because he has a plurality of first place votes. He doesn't have a majority, but he does have a plurality. But under the point system, now Clinton has a claim to being the winner. So a different scenario, a different winner. So what method of voting is the best, right? What, what is the way that, that will not violate those criteria? And which one should we be using? And, and people, again, have been studying this problem for hundreds of years. And it turns out that actually none of them, which to me, in retrospect, now that I've thought about it a little bit, I'm like, oh yeah, you can probably always violate one of those criteria somehow. But on first looking at that, I was really kind of surprised. It was something that I had never really considered. And I guess more than just the mathematics behind it, just, just like morally and philosophically, I, I feel cheated. I feel like, right, there's got to be a way to go out there and have fair elections, right? That's just uh, uh, the way it should be. Well, turns out it's not. And I think this is super cool. So again, a neat place where math, you know, is intersecting our day-to-day -day life. And maybe something that you, a connection you wouldn't initially consider. So it turned out in his thesis, the economist Kenneth Arrow mathematically proved that it is impossible for any particular voting system to always guarantee fairness. So that was just the, the start of his illustrious career. So, uh, you know, what a way to start. You know, that is a huge result. I think this is, again, super awesome. So again, that's not to say that fair elections never occur, because that's not what's happening. But it does say that after you pick which one of your favorite methods you should use, and you can always you know, come up with a different method, it says there's, you can always find situations where at least one of those fairness criteria will be violated, and therefore the election is not fair. So next time somebody starts telling you, they start saying, it's not fair, we got cheated, we got cheated, you know, the system is rigged, well, you can say, of course not, because just let us consider that groundbreaking work of Mr. Arrow and his famous book, Social Choice and Individual Values, published back in 1951 to see why this must be the case. And they'll probably give you a blank look, but I think that would be a good reply. So anyways, I hope you like this video. If you do, uh, please consider being a patron on Patreon. Uh, you can just do a search, Patreon, Patrick GMT. You can be a donor for as little as $1 a month. I would appreciate it. I'm on Twitter, not much of a tweeter. Sometimes I po post random stuff, but uh, if you're bored, come check me out. So again, I hope you like this video and stay tuned for more. Thanks.